the opening lines of Charles Dickens's Tale of Two Cities. Uh, now I have to uh, admit I haven't read it at all, um, but don't draw too many parallels from it if you have read the book. Uh, it really is set at a time uh, in the French Revolution um, before and during. And um, I think what's important is what Dickens is trying to uh, portray in that time is that his belief of the possibility of resurrection, in a figurative sense, and transformation on both a personal level and a societal level. And I think that's what we've seen uh, over the last couple of weeks, specifically here uh, in Belito. And I think that really comes to um, the heart of, of where we need to be as a church from a ministry point of view, and is that is reaching out to the local community and making sure that we're having an impact here uh, on the North Coast. Not that it's the mission of the church to give outreach, but certainly it gives the character and heart uh, of what we are as a body of Christ. So on that note, what I'd like to do is uh, we're going to have a, a quick interview. Uh, Rat is going to interview Kent, um, and between Kent and Lindell, they've been spearheading a fantastic initiative here on the North Coast. And um, just before we get to that, I have to share a quick story, and that was that at probably about 10 to 12 days ago, uh, I was standing on the Tiffany's Bridge, um, directing traffic mainly, uh, and also just turning people away, unfortunately, because our shops were closed, petrol stations were closed, most of the ATMs were out of money, and so I was really, literally welcoming them onto the bridge and then sending them on their way. And while I was doing that, of course, uh, one couldn't help but notice the, uh, the big American on a small scooter with a strange helmet uh, whizzing past me. Um, time and time again, and, and Kent would always wave, and on one of the times he actually stopped, and I uh, said to Kento, what are you doing? Uh, because he was going the opposite direction to everyone, and that was across the, uh, the end too. Um, and he said, no, I, I went grocery shopping, and he had this small sort of packet between his legs, and I said, chief, uh, you got a big household, that's, that's not going to do much, and he said, no, I don't really need the groceries. Uh, he said, I went there to go chat to them. Um, and I felt that was fantastic, uh, a great opportunity that uh, um, he undertook. And, and I think it's now taken on legs, and it's really, really uh, amounted to something. So, uh, Rat, Kent, if I can ask you to come up and we're, we'll hear from them about what's happening uh, in the Hearts at Hope um, initiative. Well, good morning, church. It's great to be here on this rather chilly morning. Um, but it's, a, it's, yeah, it's, it's just great to be able to interview you, Kent. Um, come squash this way so that you're on screen. Um, so for those of you out there who don't know, Kent, tell us just who you are and uh, what are you doing at the moment? What are you involved in the Hearts That Hope stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, so me and my wife run Hearts That Hope. It's a children's home here in Belito. And we started that about eight years ago. And yeah, we love the ministry we have and enjoy it on a daily basis. So we raise in 15 kids at the moment. That's what we're doing. <laughs> 16, it includes you. Um, <laughs> so, so Kento, tell us, like, as Sean said, you know, I've seen it as well. You, you've, been, you've been going to Shaka's Head and Shiamoya, and um, I've been up there, and I did this little scooters buzzing around, um, and it's you on it. Mm -hmm. What have you been up to this week? I know it's been a busy week uh, post the, the big uh, thing that's been going on with the looting and that kind of stuff. Tell us um, what you've actually been doing. Um, the last week going out, uh, it was just overwhelming to me, uh, meeting the people in the community, and, and a lot of them, like, there, there wasn't hope. There was no hope there. There was, they just, they, their, their whole area had been village in Sh Shiamoya. So uh, last Saturday, my wife came up with a plan to stock a shop, one shop. And um, so we, I said, Let, let's do it. Let's put it out there to our friends and people that would be interested. We thought groceries would just come over to our house and, and it would be that. And then this, we, we put it out there last Saturday and woke up um, Sunday morning to 100 grand in our bank account and said, I guess it's more than one shop and let's get on this. And this week has just been just a blessing. Like I'm getting to be in the township probably eight hours a day, um, getting to meet the people, um, pray for people, see the shops, and, and get to meet these shop owners that are like, they're just sitting there going, we don't know what to do. We have no insurance, we have nothing. They've, they've took everything. 
and they, they go into their shops and it's just devastation. How, how many, Kenta, how many shops are you, you guys have stocked? 10 shops mm. so far. How many shops are there? Tell us more about these shops because yeah. it's not more than just stocking them. It just, yeah. So just tell us a little bit about that. So the shops are sponsored shops in the community. There are hubs in these communities. There's, um, we stocked 10 yesterday. That was our first um, mission. And in Shiamoya, there's 30. And then I've been going to the next township and the next township and the next township. And I have over about 65 on our books right now that um, we'd like to get to and stock, and it's 7,500 Rand to stock one shop. Uh, but then we've also been doing, um, trying to repair them as well. Um, yeah, the, there's holes in their walls, there's roofs that have been torn off. Um, All in the looting. Yeah. All in the looting, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're, not, we're not upgrading places. Okay, now, now, now Kento, tell us, why on earth are you doing this, Bri? Mm. Just why, For what reason? Yeah. So when I, when I first went out in, like uh, Sean was talking about when I, I said, Sheesh, this is a dark time. I was, Monday, I was petrified of the Monday that the looting was going on. Sitting in my home, I'm like, Sheesh, there's no cops inside, there's nothing. And um, by Wednesday, I'm like, no, this is even more crazy because we're, it's just, this is a weird time and I don't know what to do with it. So I just said, God's called me to be a light. And what better time to be a light is in dark times. <laughs> and this was a dark time. Um, for South Africa. And I just said, I, I'm going to be the light. I want to shine Jesus to these people. I want to meet people. This is a time that is easy. The, the, the harvest is plentiful right now. Let me go out and take advantage of this. And that's what I want to share Jesus with these people any way I can, whether it's my actions or my words, I'm going to do it. Excellent. Th th thanks, Ed Kenta. That's because, I mean, a lot of people are handing out food. So you're doing it for, uh, for Christ, the character of Christians, going out there. What is your hope um, for what happens through this and, and after this mm. um, for the, the Stocker Shop thing, and particularly for yourself and Lyndall in what you're doing as Christians? What's your hope? Yeah. The biggest hope is just to have people come to Jesus. Um, so my dream as a missionary was to go serve in the Middle East, and through this, I think God's brought the Middle East to me. Um, I'm, these shop owners are mostly Pakistani, Somalian, Ethiopian, um, speak in Arabic, and I wanted to go to Lebanon and be a missionary. And now I'm sitting in a township with, there was 25 shop owners, and I'm saying, let's, okay, let's pause, let's take a moment to pray. And I'm sitting there with, I don't, there's a few Christians among them, but most of them are Muslim. And I'm sitting there getting to pray with 25 Muslims. And I'm like, this is what I'm doing it for. This is the only reason I'm doing it. It's great that I can serve the community, but my overall goal is, is Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. I need to be that for other people as, as best I can. I can't be Jesus, but I can be a vessel. It's awesome. One last question. How can we pray for you at this point? Because I know it's been a, it's been a chaotic week. Uh, God, has, God has come to the party. Um, well, it's, it, it is his party, but uh, it's been a wonderful week, but it's been a difficult week, and there's still more going on. How can we specifically pray for you as a Christian community? Um, so far, it's been amazing. We've been working about 15-hour days and have the energy. God's given us the energy. Um, I'm excited to get up every morning. Um, prayer is just for wisdom on how to, how to handle each one. Right now, it's very, very difficult because now I'm getting phone calls from more than just spaza shops. Um, went to the shop right next to KFC in, in Sh Shaka's Crawl, and it's a family, and they're saying, we have no hope. And I'm like, I don't know what I can do. So just pray for that protection of my heart um, when, I'm, when I'm speaking to people that I can't help, and also pray that I give God glory when I do get to help. It doesn't, it doesn't fall on my, I don't pat myself on the back all the time. Um, that God, it's still God's work, um, and I can see that happening when you're meeting people like I'm, I'm, I'm not the vessel now. I'm the most important one. That just pray for the protection over that. That I, we stay humble in this, and it's just a team of four of us doing it right now, and it's been awesome. So just uh, strength, protection over being, staying humble, um, and just more opportunities to. That yeah, I, mean, I take the opportunity. There's a family who's saying we haven't got any hope. What yes. opportunity for the gospel? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That, those are the yeah. opportunities. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. So, yeah, and those, those, those areas is key for us. Excellent. 
Thanks, Kent. Uh, folks, keep keep praying for it. Uh, go onto the website if you want to contribute. Um, speak to Kent if you want to get involved. There's lots to do, lots of opportunities for the gospel, lots of opportunities for us to be a light in this uh, in this community uh, in these times. Uh, pray for Kento. Also, pray that Kento doesn't uh, overextend energy-wise. You know, I phone him at like half past six in the morning. Okay, Kento, what are we doing? What's the next truck? And he's already in, in Shiamoya on his scooter, so... Um, we'll pray for him, but awesome. We thank God for Kenton and Lyndall. Guys, I'm going to quickly pray, and I'm going to hand over back to, to Sean. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. Uh, Jesus, we thank you that you have uh, worked in our hearts to love the community that uh, we find ourselves in. Uh, we pray that you'd help us to continue to be a light in your community, and we pray particularly for opportunities for your gospel. We pray that people will hear of our lips how magnificent and beautiful you are, especially in sending Jesus to die in our place. There are so many that are hopeless that need to hear that message, Father. We pray that through this initiative, many will come to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sean. Again, Rett, uh, Rett, thanks so much. Um, yeah, once again, Hearts That Hope. Check it out. Google it. Put it on Facebook uh, and uh, find out a little bit more about it. So shifting gears now, uh, of course it's time to pull the kids in nice and close as we look in at uh, part seven of the series uh, following Christopher Mouse and his uh, adventures. So let's, uh, let's hear from that. Welcome guys. So again, my name is Michael and I'm the children's worker here at Christchurch North Coast. And before we continue with part seven of Christopher Mouse and the Evergreen Wood, first, let's think a bit about our memory verse. Kids, do you remember the memory verse? Say it with me. It says, do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. That's right. And we've learned what that means. That means we must follow what the Bible says and not go our own way. But here's a question for today. What do we do? When we meet people who are not following the Bible, what do we do when we meet people who are going to the left or the right, who are going their own way? What do we do then? Well, let's watch closely to this installment of Christopher Mouse and see what Christopher ends up doing. So, let me pop out and find Christopher. Whew, that dark valley! was intense, but I'm finally out of it. <sighs> Following the narrow path, let's see where it goes next. Oh, is that, is that singing? Even though I walk alone, oh. through Black Valley is far from home. On this way I shall not fear, hardship soon will disappear, and at last I shall be safe. When I reach that wondrous place. Faithful! Christopher! Faithful! I was hoping to see you. Where have you been faithful of a mouse just like me from the Darkwood? How are you? Where have you been coming from? I left the Darkwood soon after you did. I, I knew it was the right thing to do. It just took me a little longer to realize. It's so good to see you, faithful. Now, are you going to the Evergreenwood too? I am. Yes, let's go together. Come on. Ah, we just got to follow the narrow path. Ooh, what's that up ahead? Looks like a fair. A fair? What does that sign call it? Is it... Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair. Ooh, let's go have a look. Oh, it's a bunch of rats. They live here. And they, they're making their money on people who pass yeah. by. Selling oh, things. What are they selling? What's that over there? Looks like a key. Oh, they've got whisker curlers. Yeah. And they've got they've got bows for your tail, Faithful. Ball polish. And polish for our claws. What are they selling? And and that's and what's that over there? Cure all potions. I'll be, I'll be. Oh, and what's he selling over here? Let's go ask this guy what's going on. Good sir, what are you selling? Howdy, howdy. Oh, you want to see what I'm selling? Yes, come look. I've got keys. I've got keys. keys. Now, let me guess. You're going to the Evergreen Wood. I am. You are. The, uh, to get in to the Evergreen Wood, you yeah. need a key. I've got some keys. I, I already have a key, sir. Oh. And a real one. Huh? And I didn't have to buy it. It huh? was given to me for free. Don't you by be the white lamb. Don't you be clever with me, boy. On with you, on with you, on with you. Christopher, look here. Yes, yes, yes. They have some maps. maps. Do you think they have a map of the evergreen wood? Let's ask him. Where's where's he? Oh, there he is. So there again. Is. 
Hey, Irish boys, yes, boys. Well, what you looking for? What you looking for? Maps and evergreen wood. You want maps? Maps? I've got maps. I've got maps. Let me see. I've got a nice map here. Yeah, I'm... Nice map. Oh, boggy bog. No, I'm trying to go to the... No, no, no. Boggy bog. The great evergreen. place. Firm, firm ground. The boggy evergreen. Bog. Oh, okay, okay. Wood. Uh, uh, poison ivy. No, it's the evergreen wood. That's where we're trying to go. No, no, to... no. Poison ivy park. Good food. Good food. Is it just the evergreen wood? Uh, uh, oh, here you go. I've got the one you want. Dark wood, all the way back there, gray place, dark wood, full of potential. No, sir. No, no, oh, okay, okay, well, on with you, on with you, on with you. Oh, faithful, we got to get out of this we, we vanity need. fair, we let, we let's go. Let's go, let's hurry straight on through, faithful. Oh, well, let's leave this bland as quickly as possible. Oh, is that a mouse? Green mouse, what are you doing in those stocks? Are you okay? He can't even, he's been crying. Let me, let me try to get you out. Oh, I'll come back, I'll get you out. His feet are locked in the stocks. What are you gonna do, Faithful? Chief of the rats, chief, where are you? Where's the chief rat? <coughs> oh, what's, what's all this, what's all this then? It's me, the chief rat, what's all this then? Why is Grey Mouse in the stocks? What uh, harm has he done? We don't like his type, yeah? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, thinks he's better than us. Calls us cheats, the little upstart. Mm -hmm. But you are cheats. Huh? Every one of you. Huh? Not a single item you sell is of huh? any use. You cannot buy one good thing. Huh? Huh? Who do you think you are then? Huh? You think it's too good for us too? Hey uh, boys, get a load of this lot. Think they're too good for us? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, he came to my store, didn't buy a thing. Yeah, let's show them do good as what for. Yeah, I agree, boys, I agree. Come here, you lot, let's put you lot in some cuffs and lock up your feet there. Little mouse, you can, little gray mouse, you can go. Let's lock up Faithful. What's your name? Christopher. Let's lock Christopher up as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, just right, that's right. Hey, boys, get some fruit. Let's throw some rotten fruit at these boys here. Yeah, this boy Christopher and Faithful. Let's get some rotten fruit. Yeah, that's what you get, you goody goodies. That's what you get, yeah. We're coming here and not buying our stuff. That's right. Mm hmm. <laughs> Faithful. What we're we gonna do? Faithful. Christopher, the good book. It says to love your enemy. Mm, that's right. I remember that. That's right. We must love them. Let's love them. That's right. But how are we gonna get out of this? We must trust in God. Mm. And come back next week to see what's gonna happen. Christopher and Faithful. And we'll see you then. Cheers. Well, there you have it. Uh, thanks, Michael. He is here today, despite that being a, a video recording. And uh, well done to Matt as well, being the uh, Faithful uh, sidekick um, on this occasion. Uh, folks, once again, we're going to change gears right back again. Uh, we're going to spend a bit of time in, in prayer. Uh, after which we'll be reading from the Bible. So, um, yeah, I know that uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, what we've been through, uh, a lot of it terrible, many good things have come out of it. And one of them is I've heard one or two people who I would have never have thought um, actually say to me, Sean, I started praying. Um, and, and that was a wonderful thing. I don't think they know who they're praying to and, and, and how to pray so to speak, but um, certainly it's a step in the right direction and one that uh, presents a great opportunity. Um, so yeah, I'm going to ask that we just quieten our hearts and minds. Um, I'm going to give us a few moments uh, just to do just that. So close your eyes um, and yeah, um, just try and center your focus and attention um, on, on here and now. Heavenly Father, we just give thanks that um, even in these times with these difficulties, um, we're still able to gather, Lord. It's in a different way, but we have the opportunity, we have the means, um, and that's a massive blessing and one that you give thanks to you and all glory to you for that, Lord. We just think of those in the last week who have counted the costs of the devastation um, of the looting and the riots, 
um, both financial, emotional, uh, and also practical, Lord. We know that going into the weeks and months ahead, there will be many challenges for many people. Um, and once again, Lord, that will be an opportunity for us to be the light in the community, for us to show the heart of the Christian um, and to bring their eyes to you. We're also sorry, Lord, that uh, in this crisis, like with many others, um, some of our sins get exposed. Um, sorry that we depend on our own efforts, on our own strength, um, and our own means, when we know that ultimately all our strength comes from you. We just pray, Lord, that as we move forward, we won't forget and won't move on as if nothing, in essence, has happened. It seems that life is almost moving too fast back to what we think is normal. Um, and I just pray that you'll use this moment to, to teach us what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to uh, hold on to our hope uh, that we have in you for ultimate glory. We just ask, Lord, that um, you pour out your blessings to all churches and specifically those that are still persecu persecuted uh, in different countries, um, those that uh, find themselves in places that are hostile to the gospel, um, and even those, Lord, that maybe don't have the means to be able to connect and gather as, as we have. And we just ask, Lord, that um, yeah, you continue to be with each and every one of us in this church, I just ask today that each and every person will feel your presence and hear directly from you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, so if you've been around for the last couple of weeks, we've been spending time in Colossians, keep calm, and uh, today's no different. So we're going to be reading from Colossians. Uh, I'll give you a couple of moments to, to grab your Bibles, get yourself uh, familiarized there. We are still in, in chapter 1, um, and we're starting on verse 24, um, and I'll read through to uh, chapter 2, verse 5. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which, I so, pow which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all that have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith is in Christ. Thank you, Sean. And a very good morning to all of you out there. Um, if I haven't met you, my name is George, and I'm one of the pastors here at Christchurch North Coast. And it's great to be with you this morning. A very warm welcome to you if you 
are new to our church and you're joining us for the uh, first or second time, I uh, really hope you feel welcome with us, even though you're not right with us. And it'd be great to, to meet you uh, when we're back at the building. And uh, for those of you who, who've kind of been around, um, you would have known that for quite a large part of this year, we've been doing a big series in Genesis. And for the last uh, three weeks, today, and including today will be the fourth, uh, we have been doing a little series called Keep Calm and Carry On in uh, the book of Colossians, pretty much covering the, uh, what, what we find in chapter 1. And so today is the, the little wrap-up of the four-part series, and uh, we'll be finishing off that last section uh, that kind of sneaks into chapter 2 there. Now, I want to, because of that, I want to remind you of the context, because it's so important as we come to, to look at this passage and, and try and understand it. Uh, you have three separate distractions uh, that was kind of being put on these people in, uh, in the place called Colossae. The first one was that there were, there were those people who said, you need extra knowledge. You need to know more than just simply the gospel uh, that the apostles were preaching. Then the second thing was that there were those who said, you actually need an extra experience. You need to experience something uh, spiritual, something beyond uh, simply hearing the gospel. Uh, they wanted more than Jesus and the simple message about him. And thirdly, <clears throat> you had those who are pushing strict rules and ob observations of ceremonies. Uh, the gospel wasn't enough. Jesus was enough. They wanted to add on these complicated uh, ceremonies and rituals. And that is why we had that beautiful passage last week. If you're around, it's a beautiful passage lifting up the glory of Jesus and the sufficiency of Jesus and the supremacy of Jesus. That everything was created through him and for him. You cannot get anything more than Jesus himself. And so that's, that's a really important contextual stuff uh, to keep in mind. Now, what we're going to see today is that the all-powerful and supreme Jesus intended for preaching to be the means, the primary means, by which he reaches the world, transforms his people, and keeps his people on the path to life. Those are the three things we'll unpack. And if you, if you saw, the theme today is keep calm and sit under preaching. And before I, I pray, I wanted to just unpack that strange phrase, if it's, if it's new to you. What does it mean to sit under preaching? Well, the phrase came about in the ancient world. You see, uh, there were these philosophers and, and teachers, and they had disciples that would sit around them as they taught. They would literally sit under their teaching and obey what they we're saying. So it's a metaphor for listening to your, your teacher and obeying what they say. Now, there's a big difference for us as Christians and as preachers. You see, the ancient philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, they were their own authority and they came up with their own ideas. Now, true preachers, on the other hand, rest on the sole authority of the Bible, of God's own ideas, God's spoken word to the world. See, preachers have no authority in and of themselves. They only speak with authority insofar as they speak from the Bible. And their job is to communicate and apply God's word to God's people. It's not about sitting under rats teaching or sitting under George's teaching or any other preacher for that matter. It is about sitting under the authority of the Bible, listening and obeying to what Jesus has already said. So let's pray uh, as we come to try and do that today. Father God, we thank you so much for the gift of, of your word. 
and the gift of preaching. Lord, in your wisdom, you have chosen for preaching to be the means that you make yourself known, that you transform your people and that you keep your people. And we pray that you would do that for us today. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come now and make yourself known to those who do not know you, that you'd transform us who do know you, and that you would keep us on the path to life. Please come and do that as we open your word. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So if the first thing we're going to look at is preaching makes Jesus known. Look what Paul says there in verse 25 of chapter 1. So as, as you saw there, it was read chapter 1 kind of goes into chapter 2. So, so it's, it's one section. So we're going to look uh, at both chapter 1 and the start of chapter 2. It says there in verse 25 of chapter 1, this is Paul speaking, I've become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. So Paul says, I've become its servant. Now who or what is the its? So let's read again from verse 24 to get the, the answer. He says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant. So the it's in verse 25 is the church. Paul is a servant of the church. Do you see that? Now, in what way does Paul say he is a servant of the church? He tells them plainly, he's been commissioned for a purpose, and that purpose is to preach. It says in verse 25, to present the word of God in all its fullness. So preachers are servants of God's people, the church, and their job is to present the word in all its fullness, to preach from the Bible and not their own ideas. Now, verse 25 through verse 27 shows us that we should be committed to preaching the word because it makes Jesus known. Look at this beautiful little passage. It says, I've become the church's servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in all its fullness. Carrying on the thought, the mystery That has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, that's the Lord's people, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, sorry, the Gentiles, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, if you read that carefully, you would have noticed all this language, all these words speaking about known things and unknown things. Now verse 26 speaks about the mystery that has been kept hidden. That's all unknown. Mystery kept hidden, unknown language, but is now disclosed or revealed to the Lord's people. Then verse 27 says, God has chosen to make known Among the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews, people who didn't know uh, God, the God of the Bible. The glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And there it is. Can you see that the mystery, the thing that was kept hidden, the thing that was not known, is now revealed, and it is Jesus And the message of Jesus, which is the gospel, the hope of glory. And this is why we must sit under preaching and the preaching of the word. Because it is the means that God uses to make the riches of his glory known to the world that does not know him. Now most of us who call ourselves Christians... uh, you might be listening to this and um, 
you remember that at some stage in your life, you listen to someone open the Bible. It might have been in a kind of church preaching context. It might have been one-on-one or in a kind of smaller group. But as that person opened the Bible and spoke, a miracle happened. And you move from spiritual deadness to spiritual life. You move from not knowing who Jesus was. Whether you had thought about it or not, it was a mystery. And then it was revealed to you. It became known. You went from being completely blind to the things of God to having your eyes open and seeing who Jesus is, that he is your Savior and that he is your Lord. And that changed your life forever. That is why preaching and opening the Bible is so important because it makes Jesus known. Now you might say, well, If the purpose of preaching is to make Jesus known, then what if I already know Jesus? What what if I'm a Christian? What if I've come to know Jesus? Then does that mean I don't need to sit under preaching anymore? Well, not so fast. We will also see right here that preaching transforms you. That's the second thing I like to point out this morning. Preaching transforms you. Have a look at verse 28. Paul says, He is the one we proclaim. Talking about Jesus. Jesus is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. See, the Christian growth process starts and continues and finishes with Preaching and teaching about Jesus. Not only does preaching make Jesus known to you, not only do you become a Christian as someone tells you what the Bible says, but it's also the thing that continue to, continues to mature you as you walk the path of the Christian life. In chapter 2, verse 2, if you glance down, is a very surprising order of things. Look at what it says. This is Paul. He says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. That's the goal. So that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. So Paul says he is aiming for the Colossian church to be strong in heart, to be encouraged in heart, And united in love. That's his goal. So that, or in order for, so that they have full riches of complete understanding. See, Paul doesn't say his goal is that they have a high level of understanding. So that their hearts are strengthened and that they begin to love each other. Works the other way around. Knowledge and understanding for Paul is a byproduct of having your heart strengthened by Jesus and being united to each other in love. Knowledge and understanding don't produce maturity. It's the other way around. It's the opposite way around. Maturity produces knowledge and understanding. See, it sounds a bit backwards. But think about it like this. If, if you're someone who runs a business, I'm pretty sure that you would like to employ someone for a particular position in a particular field that has lots of experience. So there's, there's someone with 30 years experience that know their trade backwards. And then you've got someone who's fresh out of university that has a piece of paper that says that they know what to do. You see, years of being in the trade and in the field give you a knowledge and understanding that someone with a piece of paper doesn't have yet. It's the same for Christian maturity. As you get to know Jesus, as you get to know the person of Jesus, who he is, and your relationship grows, it's then 
that you grow in wisdom and understanding and knowledge. See, it's then that you are transformed to be more like Jesus, the only true and wise one. See, you can know a lot about Jesus. You can know a lot about the Bible. You can have plenty of knowledge in your head and still be completely immature. You can look nothing like the person you're meant to look like, Jesus himself. And that's why people with PhDs in theology still commit adultery. People with PhDs in theology still wreck their lives in all sorts of ways. It's not about having information in your head. It's about being transformed in your heart by the person of Jesus. See, sitting under preaching is not only vital to coming to know the person of Jesus. It's vital to being transformed by him and maturing in him. The third and last thing to see from this passage is preaching keeps you on the path. I hope the kids have been enjoying the uh, the, the Evergreen Woods story. We've heard a lot about staying on the path. And I know many of you adults have been probably enjoying the, the, the Evergreen Wood more than the kids. Um, and it's, it's, it's just such a nice, simple uh, expression of what the Christian life is like. Many difficulties along the way. But we are called to stay on the path. And one of the things that, it, that takes us off the path are when we are deceived. And Paul deals with this, this in, in chapter 2, verse 4. It's kind of how he closes this section. He says, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. If you've been watching Christopher Mouse's journey, he's had lots of things come and try and deceive him, come and try and take him off the path. And remember the context of the people in, in Colossae, this church, this Colossian church. There were those who, who were insisting that they needed more knowledge. They needed to know more things. There were those that said, no, you've got to have some higher spiritual experience than this Jesus can offer. And then there was some that were saying, you need to follow all of these traditions and laws and ceremonies. And Paul is saying that, as you sit under preaching, the, the word getting into you week in, week out is the thing that keeps you from being deceived. Look at verse 4 again. It says, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. The preaching of the Bible consistently and sitting under it is the thing that's going to keep you from being deceived. He's saying as your faithful leaders continue to proclaim the gospel and teach it to you, warning you, admonishing you, you will grow in your faith and you will not be deceived by the things that the world is throwing at you. And then see how Paul concludes in verse 5, that he delights to see how disciplined this church is and how firm their faith is. In Christ is. Sitting under preaching is the thing that keeps you on the path. And it's a discipline. It's a discipline to make sure that you're sitting under preaching. And it's central to giving you the firmness of faith that the Colossian church was known for. And what we do know from this passage is this. If we are sitting under preaching week in and week out, we will be far less susceptible to fall for false teaching or for the false arguments that the world is constantly bombarding us with, that our culture is always trying to suck us into and drag us away from Jesus with. Now, as a church, I believe we should be very thankful. I think 
the Lord has been very kind to us in the past 18 months of craziness. Uh, many ways we can say Christchurch North Coast is still standing. Many of you are still on the path and clinging to Jesus as best you can. But we've got to say this, there has been a drift. And you'll know if you've been around. There are some people who are regulars at Christchurch North Coast that have drifted away. And there's a lot of factors to that. But one of the central reasons that people drift away from church is that they begin to say no to preaching. Maybe not uh, intentionally at first, but they begin to stop sitting under preaching regularly. Some of those people may never come back. That's a reality that we need to face. See, when you say something like, this online thing doesn't suit me and, and I'll come back when things are normal, you reveal a deadly dangerous attitude in your heart that says you don't really need preaching. See, you can get along just fine on your own. And that is like a branch saying to a tree trunk, I'm going to cut myself off. I'll be fine on my own. And the thing with, with a branch, when you cut it off a, a trunk, it, it does survive for a while. There is some sap within it that keeps it going. The leaves don't wither immediately. But after time, that branch dries up and it dies because it is not connected to the trunk, the body, the church, the vital preaching that keeps it alive. It's like the Christian who cuts themselves off from the church and from the gift of preaching. Now, there's so much in there to, to think about for ourselves. But the first thing I really want to push, and it's an obvious one, is that we need to humbly sit under preaching. And there's a few things to think about underneath this point. It really comes down to this, though. And it's this question. Who is the ultimate authority in your life? Does the word of God rule over you? Or do you put yourself over God's word? What this means practically is that if God's word is the ultimate authority in your life, you will prioritize sitting under preaching. In other words, very explicitly, you will make Sunday church the central meeting of your week. And more important than any other week, any other meeting you have during that week because it is the primary place where God addresses his people through his word and through preaching. It also means that you come and sit under preaching even if you don't like it all of the time. Now I know of a church where some members would phone the office on a Thursday or Friday, and find out who was preaching on the Sunday. And if it wasn't their preferred preacher, they wouldn't come. Now that church is a disgusting attitude, and I chose that word carefully. It's a terrible, terrible attitude because it reveals that people have a self-serving view of preaching. It reveals that they want something and they will only come if they're going to get what they want to get. It doesn't see God as the ultimate speaker when preaching happens. Humbly sitting under preaching also means that you stay engaged even if you think the sermon series or sermon topic isn't particularly relevant. And, and within that, to s just think about that for a moment. It's, it comes down to the authority question. To say something in the Bible isn't relevant to you 
is, again, to put yourself over the Bible in authority. It is to say, I will decide when I need to come and listen to preaching and to when God speaks to his people. I can skip listening to this particular thing. Be careful of that. One more under this point. Humbly sitting under preaching also means that you stay engaged even if you disagree with something that the preacher has said. Now, preachers are not perfect. It seems so obvious, but I'm going to say it. Preachers are not perfect. They make mistakes. Uh, we sometimes say, say some things that uh, result in more confusion than clarity. Uh, we sometimes say some things uh, with a, a harsh tone. But a humble approach means that you stay engaged, you stay listening, and you, you, you ask and you, you engage afterwards and you, you, you try and figure out what was, uh, what, was, what was said instead of dialing out and saying um, and writing off everything else that was said. Second thing to consider, allow preaching to change you. Now, the point follows, this point kind of follows from humbly sitting under preaching. But preaching will never change you if you aren't humble to the work of what God is doing, the work of the Holy Spirit. There is a sense in which sitting under preaching should be painful. Um, the most transformational preaching I've ever listened to has been painful. It has hurt me. Uh, I'll never forget listening to a sermon on, on Matthew chapter 7, the verse that says, narrow is the path that leads to life and few find it. Uh, I was 20 years old and uh, as soon as that sermon finished, I, I grabbed the two friends that were sitting with me and ran outside and went around the corner and said, you guys need to pray. And I wept and wept because I had been living the path that was leading to destruction. Uh, I was calling myself a Christian, but I wanted to live with the world, live like the world. And that particular sermon uh, wounded me deeply, but it wounded me to heal me, and it did the work that needed to happen. And I'm so grateful for for God using that in that moment, even though it was uh, a very uncomfortable experience. Um, and we need to be careful in how we uh, listen to preaching. Uh, I know some of us love preaching. We love uh, listening to preaching. Uh, I'm one of those sermon junkies. But there's a subtle danger in this that we need to be aware of. You have to ask yourself, what is it about preaching that you really enjoy? See, do you love preaching for the interesting things that you learn? For the knowledge you get in your head? Do you love it because of the, the amazing things about the historical context? You know, in Colossians we've learned about the fact that, church, uh, that, that Paul was, was writing from, from prison in Rome and that this church in Colossae had all these... Uh, things that were, that were getting put on them, these, these big three distractions. See, there's, there's nothing wrong with those things. In fact, those are, are good to understand uh, the Bible uh, clearly. But if that's where we stop in our listening, that's a major problem. See, we ought to love preaching for how God uses it to transform us. To be more like Jesus. We must sit under preaching because Sunday's preaching makes us more like Jesus come Monday morning. We must be aware that having a big, knowledgeable, theological brain is dangerous if our hearts aren't changing. In fact, to have a big, theological, knowledgeable brain... And to have heart disease 
is a very dangerous place to be. I'm going to close by calling us all to join the mission of preaching. The last thing to think through. In 2004, Joel Osteen, you may know who he is. He's, one of the, he's a pastor of one of the largest churches in the world. He published a book called Your Best Life Now. And the book has since been a bestseller. Some of you know the book. I'm sure some of you have a copy of it at home. But you only have to read the title of the book to know that it's not a Christian book. Because the title is self-defeating. See, the thesis of the book is if you follow the seven steps that Joel Osteen uh, says you should follow, you will have your best life now, that God wants to give you your best life now. But if we read the Bible, God clearly does not want to give us our best life now. At least not according to Joel Osteen's standards of health and wealth and ease. God is very unconcerned with our temporary health and wealth and happiness and comfort. He is far more concerned with our eternal health, our eternal wealth, and where we will be in eternity. And that is why he sent his one and only son to die on our behalf. See, Jesus died to make peace with God possible for you and for me so that we might enjoy eternal glory with him. He didn't die so that we don't get sick now, so that we can drive a Porsche now. If you have your best life now, it means that you will not be with Christ in eternity, that you have no hope of glory, and that you're headed for hell. Now, what on earth does Joel Osteen and his book have to do with us today? Well, I think it has everything because the success of this so-called Christian book in our so-called Christian culture is very revealing. How different is this attitude to what we see plainly in the Bible again and again? And it's what we see here. In fact, before we go to Verse uh, 24 again, let me give you what the Lord Jesus himself said. He says this, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That's from John 12. And this is pretty much where our passage started. Paul says in verse 24, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. And what this verse simply means is that when Christians are happy to suffer for the sake of the gospel, it demonstrates what Jesus is like. Jesus, in dying for sinful humanity, made it possible to offer the message of the hope of glory to that same sinful humanity. And because of Jesus' supremacy and his all-consuming value, he lacked absolutely nothing. The only thing that is lacking is Jesus himself telling us the news. But this is not a mistake. It is God's design. Jesus is on the throne ruling from heaven. And from that place, he calls ordinary people like you and I to join his mission to present the news of his sacrifice to the world. And this is how you and I can fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions as we are prepared to sacrifice and suffer to show what Jesus is like to the watching world. 
Here's a story of this in action. This is from about the 1950s. There was a local missionary who walked barefoot from village to village preaching the gospel in India. His hardships were many, and after a long day of walking many miles and experiencing much discouragement, he came to a certain village and tried to preach the gospel, but was driven out of town. So he went to the edge of the village, feeling completely dejected, and lay down underneath a tree and fell asleep. When he awoke, there were people hovering all over him, and the whole town was gathered around him to hear him preach. This is what had happened while he was asleep. The, the town had gathered gr- around to, to look at, at this guy and, and what he was about, and they saw his blistered feet, and they concluded he must be a holy man, and they were wrong to reject him. And they wanted to hear the message that he was willing to suffer to bring them. And in this way, he filled up the afflictions of Jesus with his beautiful, blistered feet and brought them the gospel. Now, that's a very literal story of what suffering for the mission of preaching might look like. But you don't have to be a preacher or a missionary uh, to join the mission of getting the gospel out to the world. Imagine God's mission as, as this metaphor. It's like going down into a deep well and rescuing those who are lost in the darkness at the bottom, lost and drowning. You see, there, there are some who are called to go down into the depths of the well, but there are others who are called to hold the rope. And whether you go down into the well or whether you stand at the top and hold the rope. Both people have scars on their hands from the mission. And those scars fill up what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. Those scars are for the sake of the message of Jesus and getting it out to the rest of the world. Now the question of suffering for the gospel is always difficult for Christians in a comfortable context like ours. I know it's, it's hard. We don't have the Romans chasing after us like, like Paul did and trying to behead him. We're not thrown in prison like he was. But we must consider what it means to join the mission of Jesus and what it means to be willing to suffer for the sake of getting that message out. A few thoughts as we close. Are you willing to have much less money than you could have in order to invest in the gospel mission? Are you willing to have much less time for yourself than you could have because you're investing that time in getting the gospel out? Are you willing to be less popular than you could be in order to proclaim the mission of the hope of glory to your neighbors and to your friends at work. There's so much more to it, but let's land there and let's close. Lord Jesus, we we pray that you would help us to consider these things. Consider what it means to Humbly sit under your word to allow your preaching to transform our hearts and what it means to join the mission of getting the gospel out to the world. Lord, we we find it hard to, to see what it means for us sometimes. And so, Holy Spirit, we beg you to to come and ignite our hearts. Give us, give us wonderful ideas as we've seen coming off the back of these 
events in our, in our province. Give us wonderful thoughts of how we might partner with the mission of getting your gospel out to Belita and beyond. Help us in this regard, we ask. For our joy and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing uh, The Love of the Father now, and then Sean will come and close at the end. Sing together. Lift up your voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring the wonders of His faithfulness forever. Sing of the victory, the hope of the world. The Savior has risen, the Spirit has come to bring our sins to life forever. Folks, thanks for joining us. That's all we have uh, time for today, and uh, I really hope that you enjoyed your time with us. Um, and at a time where we seem to be living from crisis to crisis, uh, perhaps take a little bit of a, a note from Winston Churchill where he says, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I truly believe that we have an opportunity at the moment <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, impact those around us uh, and have an influence on, uh, on them. And through that, hopefully, we can show them love, uh, give them hope, and guide them towards Jesus. So have a fantastic day. Enjoy your week. Hopefully, we'll have some good news tonight from uh, our president with regards to meeting. Um, and potentially, we'll see you in person next week. Otherwise, we'll be here, and uh, you'll be there. But we look forward to it nonetheless. Thank you. <laughs>